Um, welcome to the Weekly Colloquium at the School of Astrophysics. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Zubandi Bhattacharya from Lawrence Technological University uh, in the US as a speaker, as our speaker today. Um, so Bhubandati, like many other speakers, is, a, is an alumnus of uh, the Spain Presidency College Physics uh, Department. And after the BSc here, he went to IIT Kanpur for his master's and then to uh, University of Chicago for his PhD in particular in physics. And then <clears throat> after his uh, PhD, he went to University of Montreal as a postdoctoral scholar and then uh, spent the year in, at Wayne State University, again as a, as a postdoc, and then he joined uh, his current uh, workplace. So, Bhubanjati is an expert on uh, particle physics, and that's what we will be talking about. He's also, uh, <clears throat> I think, just uh, got his uh, tenure a few months ago, and now he's in like it's uh, normal in, in the US, just after getting the tenure, you also get a sabbatical. So he's spending uh, part of his sabbatical uh, here at residency. So you can find him in uh, our offices uh, most, most of the days of the week, other than the days when he's traveling somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> and he'll also be teaching uh, one for, uh, partly teaching one for four. So um, the story, <laughs> there's always, <laughs> sometimes there is a story, in this case there is. So um, the way I first came to know about Bhubanjati is uh, so Bhubanjati is exactly three years junior to me at this school. So the day, so the year I left presidency, he joined. So we didn't really meet at presidency. Then when I was a, as a PhD student, I used to lead with two other uh, guys uh, in our uh, in a, in a three bedroom apartment in Boston, and. <clears throat> You are missing all the story <laughs> by being five six minutes late. So, um, so one of my one of my apartment mates was uh, uh, was from chemistry school, but he also did his uh, master's at Kansh. So uh, one day I was writing something on on my notebook, and he saw and he said, "Mr. Wanda, is this uh, something about physics students that they write uh, so well, but in such small spaces?" I said, well, I tend to write small, uh, but why are you saying physics? Mm -hmm. Because, well, I had this friend at Kanpur, Bhubanjati, he used to write very small script, but the handwriting was respectable. I said, well, uh, at least you are getting something from physics, <laughs> and now you are taking two data points and making, <laughs> and making a general statement. So that is very physics thing to do, and you are telling so I am happy that I have given you something. <laughs> So that is the one thing I heard about Bhubanjali. Then I looked up and I saw that there is this, uh, this kid who is now who is, uh, was a PhD student at Chicago at that time. So then uh, after very recently, well, I think a few years ago, when, when did you came? What, what, which, what was the year when you came to the previous? 18 or 19. Yeah, yeah. 18. So, so three, four years ago, lo and behold, I finally uh, met Bhubanjali. And now he's spending uh students that you are so um again small word so uh, which uh, which uh, will not take uh, any more time so, uh, so i should also mention that bhuvanjati has also got gotten several uh nsf uh grants which is very competitive in the us because uh, many people are competing for so for theory there are not too many options uh if you are working with uh, experiments etc there are many funding opportunities uh, so that that's a great job done by going to getting all these NSF grants. Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, so without further ado, Vivanjati uh, on select puzzles in several. Thank you very much. Is it on? So you have to start recording. I, I already started recording. Uh, oh, uh, I don't know if this is on. Like the on. Keep it up. It's, uh, the sound, Hello? Yeah. Is this better? Okay. So, yeah, thank you, Ritamanda, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, so, kind of a little bit on me. And also, it's great to be back at presidency, you know, my alma mater, of course, and, you know, very fond memories of 
the color changes. So <clears throat> I apologize, I'm not an astrophysicist, I'm a particle physicist. I, a lot of the stuff that I do has connections to experiments that are done terrestrially. So these are experiments that are, you know, on ground and they collide particles and they get data. Um, these silos between, you know, different kinds of fields of physics are artificial, of course, because, you know, physics is physics describes nature. But the kind of stuff that I'm going to talk about doesn't have a lot to do with measurements that come from outside the Earth. But I thought that in order to start this conversation, since this is the school of astrophysics, we should have something that connects to astrophysics. Click on it once, then uh, click. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this picture that you see to the left is a picture taken from the particle data group, but it is really coming from several different astrophysical measurements. Right. So there is a band that you see over here. This purple band that comes from uh, measurement of the CMD and fitting to parameters. Um, and, and then there are these uh, light element abundances that you can see that are given in different colors. And this is to highlight a particular number that you find uh, by doing all these measurements, which is, which is called the variant of photon ratio, eta. This is just the ratio of the number. You just look at the universe, um, PMB or other sort of things. If you took the ratio of the number of um, baryons to the number of photons in the universe, then you find this number. It turns out to be a very tiny number. If, if you look at the scale, this size is something the negative 10. So, so this is a dimensionless number. So that's a, a, so it's a pure number. So this side is 10 to the negative 10, that's 10 to the negative 9. So somewhere in between those two numbers is, um, is this very on the photon ratio. Now it turns out that if you take the, 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 the prevalence model of particle physics, which is called the standard model, and you try to compute this number in the standard model, that number turns out to be about 10 to the negative 18. Now there is some, some kind of discrepancy between different ways of calculating that number in the standard model. So it might go from 10 to the negative 18 to 10 to the negative 20, but still there is a huge discrepancy between the number that is measured from topological um, you know, sort of data and the, and the number that you can get in the term. Okay, so that's a that's a challenge. People have tried to address that challenge in different ways by coming up with different models. Unfortunately, there is no, uh, we still do not know a con concrete way of getting to this observed number. So it tells us that there is something going on over there and something that we do not understand. Okay, so this is uh, called the observed baryon uh, asymmetry of the universe. It's a puzzle. Uh, the theory doesn't agree with the experiment. So it's also called the baryon asymmetry puzzle. So how can we address this puzzle? And it turns out that if you try to put this in an initial condition at the very early stages of the universe, you know that the universe had an inflationary period. It expanded rapidly, right? So if you put in anything that is just an initial number that is a difference between sort of the baryon and antibaryons, over the inflationary period, inflation will cause an exponential sort of change in that number. And so by the time inflation ends, that number will just um, uh, become diluted and kind of wash out. Okay, so at the end of inflation, you wouldn't have, if you put it in as an initial condition, you wouldn't have it anymore at the end. So it turns out what you need um, is a dynamical mechanism. Okay, and the dynamical mechanism has to satisfy these conditions called the Sakharov conditions uh, or Sakharov criteria, which uh, Andre Sakharov proposed in the 1960s. Uh, and there are three conditions. Uh, you need transitions that are out of equilibrium. You need baryon number violation, and you need charge um, conjugation and charge charge theory conjugation bias. Okay, so those are the three conditions. So this is the connection of the kind of particle physics that I do with the astrophysics sort of. I look at um, processes that violate CD, charge theory. Okay, and I try to find. Uh, newer sources of charge parity violations. 
um, the, who will be studying, who studied uh, of particle children and decays at, um, at um, current day uh, particle decay. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. By the way, just, just you know, to tell you, um, there are lots of slides that I have, lots of different ones. I'm going to get into technicalities of things. So if you have a question, please stop me and ask questions. While the talk is going on, I would appreciate that. And, you know, I, I really like a conversational sort of, um, sort of, um, sort of a talk because you know that kind of keeps everything lively. People don't sleep. People don't often sleep, but you know it's it's good to have conversations, right? So please do uh, stop me and ask questions. So this is the standalone. This is your customary slide about when a particle physicist gives the talk. There's this customary slide that we put up that shows the particle content of the scan model, and that's this slide. It tells you that there are the quarks. There are six quarks. Up charm top, downstream bottom. There are six similar, similarly six leptons. The fermions, these the first three rows show you the fermions. The fermions in the stellar model are sort of aligned in three generations. We, we don't know why there are three generations. That's the question. Sometimes people talk about how um, God might be a bureaucrat because he likes everything in triplets. So those are the three, you know, everything along this column, they're just three copies of. Right? We do not understand why why there are three generations. Okay, and then there are the gauge bosons. These are the gauge bosons. There's the photon and then the, the blue on the photon and the massive, two massive weak interaction gauge bosons. And um, you know, I've been talking about these and generation of mass through the scan model and a part of the physics sort of scan model class that most of have in there. And uh, so if you attended that, you know that these uh, gauge was gauge was on masses come from what is called the Higgs mechanism. And so of course there is a particle associated with the Higgs me mechanism, which is a fluctuation around the vacuum expectation value. And that's the that's Higgs boson, which was again discovered um, the latest addition to the standard model um, particle contact. Okay, so but so this is well and good. But of course, you doesn't explain everything. One of the things that doesn't explain the variant symmetry problem. Um, there is also other things it doesn't explain. So in particular, you know, as I said, three generations. We don't know why there are three generations. Uh, we also don't. Uh, I mean, this this picture doesn't, you know, have things like dark matter or dark energy things that uh, people have had this indirect uh, evidence for. We don't have a direct evidence for dark matter or dark energy yet, and which is sort of, you know, if there was direct evidence for dark matter, there would be a particle that existed, you know, the standard model was that, and it will then be free to, to list those particles. Okay, so for for the rest of the talk, when I talk about puzzles and anomalies, this was the topic is select puzzles in these case. So the puzzles and anomalies, what puzzles and anomalies mean is you make a standard model prediction, you Go to the standard model, do a calculation, so you make predictions, and then you go measure at an experiment, and you find that these two numbers do not agree with each other. Which means that there is something new that you need. Sometimes we might not even know what that new thing is necessary uh, to explain everything, uh, to explain all of the different puzzles that we're observing. But anytime there's this discrepancy, we'll talk about a puzzle or an anomaly. And the idea generally is that there is this sort of um, talk between at least in particle experiments, the intensity and energy frontier. So when you go in the energy frontiers, what you're trying to do is you're trying to directly discover a new part. So for example, before the Higgs, you know, the energy scales of the previous detector was much lower. So we increased the scale of energy at which the LC currently works, and we discovered the Higgs. So that was a direct discovery of a new part. It's no longer new, but it used to be new before 2005. Um, on the other hand, in the intensity frontier, what you do is the known particles that you have, you study its properties very carefully, very precisely. So you precisely measure, uh, let's say, a coupling constant between a particle, between multiple parts. And when you measure that very precisely, there's a possibility that that coupling constant will be different from what you've had in your usual theory. So that would be sort of pointing at an anomaly, right? So once you know that there is an anomaly, you can postulate that there is a new particle, and then you can go look for it 
in sort of this um, this uh, energy frontier. So there's a nice interplay between the different sort of frontiers in uh, particle physics experiments. So the baryon asymmetry problem is your that's equivalent to the fact that we don't we cannot predict the right baryon photon. Yes, with ratio yes. that we are seeing. Now. That's right. So we cannot we do not have an idea of where so well. <clears throat> You know, I mean, this has to somehow have a particle physics explanation. It can be over in down, has to be, you can predict it in the channel. Turns out that the number for the number that you get from the channel, the channel actually has all of the Shakarov criteria, right? So if you go back and, and think about this, the channel has all of these. Okay, but it turns out that for each one of the ingredients, the channel's contribution is too small. And that is why. The variance entry, the number that you get from the channel turns out to be much more of what it is in the what it is in the other. So the then the hypothesis is that there must be some new sources of each one. And so the, the work that I'm doing has to do with new sources of PP bunch. So that's where we are gonna. Oh, sorry. Yes. Right. Uh, actually, you know, the next one. Yeah. I have the same equation, but I did not mark up the Higgs system, and he actually comes from the kind of symmetry that he proposed. So the mass of the Higgs, the mass of the Higgs boson. Yeah. So yeah, so the Higgs um, has a potential. So uh, and that the potential, so the Higgs potential is something that is written in the time model. The Higgs actually gets a pair, a pair. So when you know spontaneous symmetry breaking happens, it means that the Higgs state, not the Lagrangian. The Higgs state breaks the symmetry of the Lagrangian, of the channel of the Lagrangian. So that gives the Higgs of that. Now, if you take that then and put it back into the potential term, you would see that there is a mass term that, that you can write for the Higgs. And that mass term essentially is proportional to uh, the mu parameter, which is, you know, there is a, you know, when you write a Higgs potential, there is a mu term. Yeah. Um, so it is, it, is a, a, it is continuous breaking of the SU2 left handed Higgs. Which is not exactly the current symmetry that it comes from more. Okay. So there is in the channel there is an SU2 left plus one symmetry which breaks down to so SU2 left plus one hypercharge breaks down to U1 electric magnet. And that symmetry breaking is what gives mass to the channel base. Okay. 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 Now that has repercussions, right? That also creates generation, you know, that generates masses for particles. So it also affects masses of the other particles, for instance, the well, no, so it depends on there are lots of details of it. So there, it depends on other parameters. So for instance, the masses of the fermions, right? The masses of the of the matter particles like the quarks and the leptons. Those are proportional to the Higgs there, but they're also proportional to what I call Yukawa couplings. Yeah. And those Yukawa couplings are just dimensionless numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, once you have masses of Fermi's, those terms automatically violate current But so that's a different okay. story. That has nothing to do with the breaking of SC2 left plus one. Right? I mean, so it's a consequence of it. But um, so, you know, come to my standard model class and I will tell you more about it. <laughs> Okay, so here, so we will talk a little bit of the about the masses of masses and mixing it up from. So these are actually the standard model Yukawa terms. So you can write in the standard model these flavor violating Yukawa interactions where you couple the left handed quarks to right handed uh, right handed quarks through the Higgs interaction. So here, the Q left is the left handed quark, it's a doublet of SU2, phi is the doublet of SU2. And B right is a singlet of S SU2. So you can write these types of interactions and they do not violate any of the gauge interactions of the channel. Now it turns out that, so there are other terms, of course, and I'm not writing them, but it turns out that this, this term is not just conjugate. So when you write a Lagrangian, remember the Lagrangian itself has to be a has to be Hermitian, which means that you have to write a Hermitian conjugate. If, if the term is not self conjugate, you have to write the Hermitian conjugate. Okay, so now if you apply CP, CP is essentially uh, uh, sort of taking complex conjugates of a, of a Lagrangian term. So if you take 
CP, it turns out that that term goes into its permission conjugate and the permission conjugate sort of gets becomes that term, except there is, it generates these complex conjugates of the Yukawa couplings. So the YDIJ over there, those are just numbers and those are called Yukawa couplings. So you generate these complex conjugates over here. These Yukawa, because of this pre generation that, that we talked about, right? That God is the bureaucrat with the weak, right? He knows that we need a pre generation uh, for a reason. These uh, three by three are complex. And um, it is because that this three by three, that, that this matrix is a three by three matrix, that you cannot actually phase away or phase rotate away all of these complex, complex numbers. There are some residual complex. Um, complex phases in your theory. And that's where CP violation in the standard model comes. This is the only source of CP violation in the standard model, these terms. So essentially, the way this works is that once the things get available, you diagonalize those you have a couple of matrices, and that's what generates mass for the quarks. And once those masses for the quarks are generated, you then go to the charge current interaction in the standard model, where a W goes on, interacts with an up and a down quark, okay? And this interaction has these matrices called the CKM matrix. Okay, now that, that CKM matrix is a direct consequence of this fact that we have diagonalized the first sort of terms, and that CKM matrix is a unitary matrix, okay? And the, the reason why we have CP violation in the standard model is this CKM matrix is a three by two matrix. It's a unitary matrix. Now, if you think about three by three unitary matrices, those uh, three by three unitary matrices generally have to have one phase. And uh, it's, a, it's again um, necessary to have one phase. And so that phase is what generates the divided three time. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this part. This is sort of, I mean, this is start, sort of standard in a two by, if this was two by two, right? If you have only two generations. There will be no CP bias because in two by two, unitary matrices are just rotation. So cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta. And um, and so you can, there are no complex phases. So generally, there's no CP violation. Okay, so this is the CK matrix. So now I'm going to talk about the CK matrix and why this is important, um, how we measure this. Okay, so that's the CK matrix. It uh, turns out that this is. Roughly a diagonal matrix empirically, it doesn't have to be. You know, you could have a structure that is non diagonal. It turns out once we measured it, we found that along the diagonal, the numbers are close to one, except for the first few numbers. The, the, this that is a small parameter of 0.2. And this uh, this bottom matrix, this is um, this has four parameters in it a rho, theta, and lambda. And this parameterization has the name, goes by the name of Wolfenstein parameterization of the CK matrix. Okay, so uh, nothing to really bother about here, except now when we look at the structure of the CK matrix, this is what it looks like. So that CK matrix has very large diagonal elements. Okay, and remember these are matrix these are matrix elements that are actually physical; they are measurable. So one can go to an experiment and measure each of these matrix elements, and I'll show you the current status of those measurements. So the diagonals are large. You go to the first off diagonal ones, they're sort of smaller. You go to the next level of off diagonal ones, they're even smaller. And then finally, when you go all the way to the far, farthest away from the diagonals, they're actually tons. Okay. And it turns out that those tiny ones, if I if you go back to this picture here, those ones that are farthest away from the diagonal, you see those are the ones that are tons. This one is complex, that's fine. So those are the ones that have phases. So you see the tiniest elements have phases uh, with them. So we want to measure that phase, it becomes very difficult because you're measuring the phase of a tiny number, right? So if you think about complex complex numbers, uh, if you have a tiny complex number that has a large phase, it becomes extremely difficult to measure. And so that's why, you know, that's um, sort of challenging. Okay. So there are properties of the CK matrix that we are going to, to, uh, that I want to talk about briefly. So first one is it's a unitary matrix. So if you take any row or any column, take its complex conjugate, multiply it with itself, and add it up, you should get one. 
that's the property that is the, is the unitary matrix E dagger B equals one. If you take E dagger B, the diagonal elements should be one. Okay. And then if you do this with two different rows or two different columns, and so you do the same thing, you take a column, take a product of it with the complex conjugate of another column, take a product and add it all up to get zero. Okay, so this is the other unitary condition for a for a unit. Okay, now if you look at this last one, you have three complex numbers that are adding up to zero. Right? So if you have three complex numbers that add up to zero, you can draw it in a picture on a plane, right? Because it's like three sides of a triangle. Right? So these are three, all three are complex numbers. So as if they're vectors in two-dimensional space. And so you can add them up in this fashion. So this is the picture. I've taken this picture from the particle data group again. Uh, and so this picture shows you that it has, of course, it's a triangle, but it should have three angles. And all of these parameters, the sides and, and the angles are measurable. You go to an experiment and measure this. The particular one of interest is this angle gamma, because this angle gamma is the one that comes up, that shows up in this, the phase of this element, the tiny element that I talked about. New B. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to skip over uh, the, how this uh, how this gamma is measured because I'm sort of should probably look at time as well. Kind of running low on time, so I'm going to skip over this a little bit. I'll come back to it if people have questions. But this is the status of experiments. This is the 2021 spring status of experiments. You see that triangle that I showed you. This is exactly what has been measured by different experiments. Uh, this uh, the pin pointing the triangle comes from measuring a lot of different parameters. You measure um, uh, different kinds of mixings, you measure uh, individual elements, and eventually you get uh, get this picture where you see the triangle, the alphabet number, right? Um, let's take a look at a closer picture. So zoom in to the triangle. This is what it looks like. Again, the alpha, beta, gamma, right? And this uh, this angle gamma is particularly of concern because if you if you look at the if you look closely, there's a large wedge over, it, right? So this this gray wedge. If you know, look, try to look at it carefully. This wedge over there, that wedge currently has a span of about about seven degrees. Okay, so delta gamma is of order of seven degrees from current measurements. And it turns out that theoretical methods, uh, theoretical methods that have been considered to find this, you know, value of gamma, to do the direct measurement of the gamma, those are extremely clean in the sense that they have no, they have errors from statistics, but they do not, do not have any errors from theoretical methods. Okay. So, and because of that, um, um, because of that, all you have to do is take more and more data because it's, you know, this, in order to measure it more precisely, all you have to do is take more data. Take more data, the statistic, the statistical error will go down, and eventually you will have a smaller. So that's exactly the target of this experiment called LHCB, Large Hadron Collider Z, stands for the bottom part. And their target is to, over the next 10 years, probably more than 10 years, to make this delta gamma wedge, that wedge over there, smaller up to one to two degrees. Now, if you look at this diagram carefully, you see that there is a red blob over there at the, at the corner of the triangle, right? So that corner of the triangle has a small red blob and this gamma wedge actually overlaps it, which is great, right? So there's, you know, two different measurements, two different ways of measuring the same thing, it really is that. But if you imagine that this delta gamma wedge is over the next 10 years is measured and becomes one to two degrees, and that wedge, wedge uh, gets narrower, at some point it is a possibility, it's not certain, but it's a possibility that the wedge does no longer overlap with that block. Of course, over the next 10 years, the block will also get more and more precise because there will be other measurements you know, everywhere else in this triangle people will be measuring all these other things with precision. The block, the block will also get more, more, more precise. And eventually there's a possibility that these two will not overlap with each other. 
And so if that, if that happens, then we will know, at least experimentally we will know, that there is some new source of TB virus in young cells. So this is an example of how one could look for new sources of TB virus. Okay. <clears throat> So this is, this is again another picture um, that shows you what the state of uh, affairs were uh, about 20 years ago, in 2004. So you see that the, that red blob that you see over there used to be this huge thing, right? So over the past 20 years, experiments have really constrained this, this blob into something, you know, very, very tiny, something that is sort of within this, uh, within this 7, 8 degree range. And so the main goal of the of the future program is, of course, to make this uh, smaller. And as you make it smaller, you see that there can be discrepancies. So, um, circular regions. Right? Yeah. What are the circular regions? Right. So those circular regions. You mean you mean really stones over here? Right. You see that, but there's two circular regions. Like, uh, these ones. Yeah. These the yellow ones. Yeah. I think those come from measurements of of these um, um, mixing parameters. So. Mesons mix, okay, and uh, uh, when mesons mix, um, they are essentially two state systems. So let's say you take the G0 and the G0 bar, these are mesons that are um, that are uncharged, and um, they can mix with each other. And so the two state mixing can create oscillations of, of between them. And so when when things oscillate, they, they usually have you know different maps. Right? The, the physical states have different mapping. So think you think about neutron oscillations, basically different mass states uh, overlap, interact with each other. Um, um, what is the word I'm blanking on it? But uh, interfere. So that inter from that interference, you can actually find the difference between the masses. And so that's what. So that is also. I mean, all of these parameters are related to the CKM, right? Because CT violation, the only source of CT violation is the CAM or the CKM. Right, so eventually, when you do that separation, you can show that delta mg and delta ms specifically give rise to this sort of thing. Yeah. So you are basically trying to constrain the triangle by becoming extreme. So, so people are doing experiments. What I will talk to you about for the rest of the talk is how could we do, how could we use theory to make this to augment the information that is already. So why? You know, I kind of skipped over uh, in the past is that this this part of the measurement comes from a direct what is called a direct measurement gap. So what you do is you know there are some theoretical methods that you use to figure out what gap is. So I'll show you additional methods in which you want to make the for fine gamma. And um, so once there is this anomaly in the future where experiment doesn't agree with theory. Then one can say, okay, well, there are additional methods. Can we, you know, make additions of two with these additional methods? The additional methods that I'm going to talk about are very theoretical. They have not been introduced to this yet. Okay. But the axes? Uh, the axes over here in this picture? Yes. Okay, so the axes are exactly the same as what they were. It's, it's an argon diagram, so real and imaginary, right? So this is an argon plane, complex plane, uh, real and imaginary, that's it. And uh, usually in the picture, you will say you will see that this is called a rho eta, but that's essentially this. If I go back here, this picture, okay, this top point over here is rho comma eta, and that rho comma eta comes from um, this parameterization that I had written before. It's the same as this rho and this eta. Up to some up to corrections order of magnitude as well. We don't really care about. Okay, so it is really the complex plane with the apex of that triangle being represented by rho eta. So sometimes because it's the apex that you're trying to find in experiments, so sometimes it's also called the rho eta plane. So that's why you will see that the, the picture has uh, the picture has labels rho along the bottom and eta along the, so essentially this point, this point over here, that blob, that is the rho and eta point. Yes. Are the fruits in the green case and the blue case? Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, so again, so these are different parameters. So the epsilon k particularly comes from um, uh, k short k long mixing. They have so k, again the k k long system. So there are two megons k zero and k zero bar. They mix. So again, it's a two state system. So whenever you have a two state system, you have oscillations to the right and oscillation matrix. Yeah. Yeah. So that so epsilon k epsilon k is basically mixed parameter in the k run. Okay, so now what? That epsilon k also depends on all of the CK making stuff. Well, so I just push up temporal, so I'm just letting it get right. And that's right. So people have already done that. So epsilon k is a function of, of the parameters of rho eta. People have done that calculation. And so you refit it and you get this. Um, and so you see that epsilon k is a band over here as well as over here. We don't care about this band so much. You only care about that band because that's the one where it overlaps with all of the other data. So in a global fit, that that tiny little blob is where sort of all of the data is overlapping to show you that that is what that is really the number that is. You know, find exactly where the overlap. all of them overlap, that's your solution for the. So each of these systems, the Kion system, the P system, the uh, charm system. All of these give you independent numbers, but it's only the overlap of them that gives you that row on my time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean that within one sigma it is more than one sigma? So look, I, I, I think, again, I'm, I've not done the stick myself. I think the blob that you're seeing over there, that is the one sigma of all of the global, global measurements except for gamma. It doesn't include the error from gamma. So that that blob is an in, what is called an indirect measurement of gamma from all of it. I mean, it's a triangle, right? So in a triangle, if we measure two angles, we know the curve. But you can also directly measure the curve, right? So uh, here, that blob over there combines the information for beta and alpha. Those are the other two angles, right? But gamma itself can be measured precisely, theoretically precisely, not externally precisely. There are some issues with the experiment switches to there. Right? So you can measure that independent of all of these other issues. And then what we're trying to do is to say, okay, do these overlap? Right now they do. But there's no guarantee that in the future, once the measurement gets more precise, that they do. So, uh, yes. Uh, so this data time gamma, uh, like, just like gamma, alpha and beta computer also direct measurements. Uh, no, so alpha and beta uh, come from all sorts of different sources. They are not as clean as gamma. So, um, yes. so gamma turns out to be turns out to come from the contributions in the panel that are called tree level. So when you get tree level contributions, so tree level as in you know, you know find find a gamma. Well, I mean you know the idea that there is a fine. So you draw a fine diagram for certain processes. It turns out uh, when you calculate gamma, the observables that contribute to gamma. Get only three levels. There are no loops. Uh, turns out that if you have loops, loops can have new parts. Things that you don't channel parts, non channel parts, right? But trees usually do not have these um, new parts in trees because I mean, if they have, then you would have seen them in direct, uh, in sort of direct uh, experiments at high. So we have not seen any more new particles. So we kind of think that there might be uh, new particles in the loop. Turns out that the direct measurement of gamma gets only contributions from three level processes. And so we believe that that is sort of a clean measurement of the standard model value of gamma without any, any uh, sources of new physics. So any sources of new physics might still be in the other ones, alpha and beta, because those actually are contaminated by, by the group level processes. There is no, and in fact, all of the meson oscillation, a meson oscillation is essentially a loop. In the center model. Okay, so it's, it's what is called a box chart. This is a But um, uh, there are no major operations that feed up in the center. The center model has this feature called um, uh, no tree level flavor changing neutral part. So any major operation is a neutral part because it's a neutral part is one neutral, another neutral particle. Okay, so this is an oscillation between two neutral particles, and major oscillations automatically have change in flavor. Because of B goes to B bar means that the, the B quartz has to somehow go to the B bar. So that's a flavor changing process. So in the final, it turns out that there are no flavor changing experiments at here. 
So all these on oscillations automatically in the time model are neutral. So there can be new things in the in the meson oscillations that you're not aware of yet, but there wouldn't be such things in, in this direct wedge of the time, right? So then the suggestion is, okay, uh, suggestion is, okay, well, what do you do? You think about finding gamma from processes which also get punished from loop diagrams. And this is what I'm gonna tell you about trees and loops very quickly. So this is a tree diagram in the standard model. So here a B fork is uh, here a B fork is decaying through a um, up fork, and then it emits a W particle, and then that decays to a up and a straight. And you can see that each of these vertices have uh, associated CK matrix elements. When a B goes to a U, there's a BUB. B. When a, when the W goes to U and S, you get a BUS. Right. So this amplitude, if you didn't. If you couldn't think about anything more, just think about the fact that it's going to be proportional to this quantity g b times u s. So if somehow I could measure just that amplitude, and I could extract the that you know if I from first principles if I were to were able to calculate this, I could compare the two numbers and figure out what g b is. And people do the exact same thing in order to measure, for instance, part of uh, elements like g b by instead of having a US on this side, you replace the US by a neutrino and an electron. And we know that the W coupling to an electron and neutrino is proportional to the, uh, it, 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 it's essentially one, okay, for you know, lack of a better sort of more detailed understanding or explanation, it's proportional to one. So if that's proportional to one, then if you measure something, a process where the B goes to a pile and a neutrino and electron, then from there you can just directly measure the B. So the absolute values of all of these matrix elements have been measured to what are called similar time scales, where a meson decays to one meson decays to another. Then on the, on the other side, you have a electron decay. Okay, but that's not the only information that you get, of course, because there are all these other decays, especially hadronic loop decays, and those hadronic loop decays give you more information. And it's possible that these hadronic loop decays have uh, have uh, influences from new physics, and I'll tell you why. So particularly this picture can be augmented by another picture. And uh, for some historical reasons, this diagram is called the penguin diagram. Okay, so because I use uh, penguins in my, in, uh, in, my, uh, in my research, I often try to call myself a penguin hunter. And I, I have a story associated with that. One time I wrote a paper that was uh, titled Reducing Penguin Pollution. Some, some, you know, some talk. Um, a week later, I got an email from, from somebody saying that, hey, we're doing this science uh, conference in, 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 in Alaska. Uh, we see that you've written a paper on penguins. Why would you put them talk to us? But I have to remind people it's not that same kind of penguins. Different kind of penguins. But if you wanted to be amused, then here is a picture. That's a tree. This is a penguin. If you don't see the connections, then don't worry about it. But the names are what they are. What's that? Uh, that one kind of looks like. So that that headphones are supposed to be uh, that. You see this little blob over here? That is what it, what makes it a penguin, actually. Okay, and that's the loop. You see that there's a loop, right? The top, this is the top fork in the middle, and then there's a W boson that's going around. And this, this essential feature of this uh, loop level diagram, what makes it interesting, because that loop over there, that has a heavy top, top fork in it, but it didn't have to. Let's say there's something very, very heavy, much heavier than the top fork. Um, I don't know, uh, like a sock or something, and that could run in this loop, or something else, something much more heavier could run in this loop. And we wouldn't know, because all we see in quantum mechanics is sort of the, the decay rate. We do not really see these kind of applications, and there are you know, more, more details could be hiding in there. Okay, so that's the tree and the penguin. Okay, so why are these interesting? It's because uh, you can actually write the amplitudes of decay in terms of what are called the decay strong phase. And again, this is already clear, don't worry about the equations too much. The point is that you can actually you actually get two observables out of this process. 
So the two observables are the decay rates of the um, of the uh, mesons. The mesons decay into two other mesons. You can find the decay. You go next. You can do counting experiments. You count how many times this uh, B popped up and how many times that B actually went to a pile and scale. Right? So that will give you sort of the CT average decay rate. And if you're clever, the experimenters are really clever, you can also measure the difference between the decay rate and the anti decay rate. So instead of a B meson, if you have a B bar meson, so B plus versus a B minus, you can again measure the number of times a B plus appears versus a B minus appears, and each of these then decay to your final phase, and you can take a difference. And that difference is called the direct CP asymmetry. Okay, why are these um, why are these relevant? Well, first of all, the B, if you look at the CP average branch ratio, if you operate a CP operator with that, the gamma goes to a gamma power, so nothing happens to the first, first ratio. On the other hand, over here, if a gamma goes to the gamma bar, and gamma bar goes to gamma, of course, so you see you would get a negative sign. So the CP average branch ratio is a CP odd object. And the CP, uh, sorry, the CP average branch ratio is a CP even object. It's double thing as a CP. And the other one, the direct CP symmetry is CP odd. Right? So that is uh, that that the existence of this of this direct CP symmetry tells you that there is CP values in this sample if you find non zero number first. And of course, this has been measured many, many times. Turns out that because there are only two observables, and you see that there are actually four parameters that you can actually from, from sort of a theoretical setup, you get four parameters. So just know, I mean, if you were to naively do a, do a pick and try to measure the four parameters from these two observables, that's not, that's not possible. Okay, so you have to do more things. All right, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna speed up and I'll talk about what you know. What usually what people do in this in these situations is that you then say that you can relate different sort of decays. So you relate a B decay to two pions with a B decay B slash decay to two pions. Now how do you do that? You say, well, the down fork and the strange fork kind of look same, similar. They are just you know the strange fork is the heavier the coming of the down fork. So they're almost the same, except for the mass. But in this system, the, the person is decaying in the B fork. So think about the B fork mass. The B fork is much, much heavier than both the down fork and the straight fork. So in comparison to the B fork, the down fork and the straight fork mass difference should not matter. And so we would say that the amplitudes that you get over here and the amplitudes that you get over here, they should be the same. So now you have two systems in which you have more memory. Each of the systems will each each of these decays will have the gamma and the gamma bar, right? So you have doubled the number of observables, but you have kept the same number of parameters. So now in this system, you can actually sort of run a fix. You have more observables than parameters. You can run a fix and you can extract um, both the drug parameters as well as some of these will depend on gamma because the disease. The, the vertex over there depends on BD, right? The vertex of the B to the up fork depends on BD. That depends on the phase of BD. So essentially, if you sort of write all the equations, you should be able to figure out the phase of it, phase of BD. Yeah. That's essentially the idea in any of these systems, right? So what you do is you write these in terms of parameters, you find the number of observables, and then you run a fit. And then if you have enough observables, to run a fit, then you should be able to find it. Okay, so I will discuss this in a very particular system that I um, I worked with with a with a student in the recent past, and that um, so okay. So in order to do this, what what we did was to say that the down fork and the strange fork are the same. But remember, there's also another like line of fork, which is up fork, and in fact, the up down and strange fork, all three of them. Have similar masses compared to the B mass. B is about 4 GeV ish, the quark mass, so about 4.2 GeV, while the up down and strange quark masses are in any Bs, is a half heaviest of them in the strange quark, which is about 100 GeV. Right? So it's a very, very large difference. But the up down and strange quarks are sort of the same, 
And so this, um, at low energies, this uh, tells us that there is an additional sort of um, accidental, uh, to some extent, symmetry called flavor symmetry. So in particular, um, this symmetry is called SU3 flavor symmetry because you have three quarks. And so what we can do is represent each of these quarks in terms of their SU3 quantum numbers, their SU3 flavor quantum numbers. And that's what we have done. So I'm going to write some of these things over here. So particularly, you can one can represent this should be sort of familiar. So uh, I'm writing these in terms of these uh, things called the irreducible representations of in terms of SU3. Some of them will be familiar. For instance, the I and I2, these are just like spin. So uh, if you're studying spin, you know that uh, when the spin quantum number is one half, the third component of the spin can be either one half or negative one. Right? So this is exactly the same thing here. I just, this is called either spin, it's just an internal quantum number, where uh, the up and the down quarks, if you look at look at the up and the down quarks, they have the same either spin, but they have different third component of that, one half or negative one. Hypercharge turns out to be an additive quantum number. So if you combine two things that have the same hypercharge, or they have um, things that have hypercharge, you just add that. Just like um, it's, a, it's a quantum number that's uh, kind of like electromagnetic charge, not exactly the same. Thing. So electromagnetic charge, you see two things that have charge one and charge zero, if you add them together, the total thing is not charge. Okay, so why is this interesting? It's because uh, the states that are really things that one measures in QCD are not the quark states, they're combinations of the quarks. And so when you combine a quark and an anti-quark, you get a meson, a meson that looks like this. So particularly the charge point. So the charge point is a combination of an off quark and a down anti -quark. So now you're taking a product of a P and a P bar, in SU3, right? We know that if you take uh, products of a, of a particular representation um, of, a, of an SUM group with its you know, conjugate, then you, what you get is a, a sort of a variable matrix plus some uh, plus the generators of that, SU, of that SUM. And so those are objects. So in fact, if you take three, three objects and multiply with another three objects, you get nine objects. Out of those nine objects, eight of them turn out to be the generators of that SUM. Okay. Those are these pions. And so there are actually nine of those. So there are pions, three pions, four pions. And then you have two other particles, eta and eta prime. Turns out that the physical eta and eta prime are complicated objects. They have some mixing. They have, they have some mixing between the standard and the octet. The technicalities that I don't want to go into. In the study that we did, we ignored these eta's and eta primes. So we could just study the pions of the pions and you would get perfectly good results. Okay, so now more technicality. So what we want to do is we want to study these three, the, the, the phase of these mesons into three bottom bar. Okay, so then you'd have to combine not just one pion, but you have to combine a pion with a pion, etc. And so you see the pions were octets. If I combine two pions, now you have to combine eight with two other eights. And if you take a product, eight times eight times eight, you get 500 so That's a, a very large number of states. So, in order to constrain that and try to sort of look at a limited class of, uh, class of objects, what we did is we started uh, looking into uh, states that could be symmetrized among the three particles. So, particularly, we looked at the fully symmetric state. A state where if you take two particles and interchange them, you get the same result. <clears throat> anyway. And then we also looked at the state called the fully anti-symmetric state, where if you interchange two of these particles, you get a different. Okay, so we did countings and everything. And I'm trying to rush here because how much time do I have left? 10 minutes or five minutes? Okay. So this is uh, the rest of this is not uh, as interesting as this last part. So essentially what one does is find this decay amplitude, and that decay amplitude comes from uh, using, so this is just a much mechanical decay amplitude, right? You, your V is decaying to three final state particles, standard for the hand point. This is what you would write in your, I guess, you know, third year 
quantum mechanics. So we're in the bracket. And these things over here, these are just Clem's Gordon coefficients. So Clem's Gordon coefficients are these coefficients that take uh, that uh, sort of if you were taking uh, if you are adding angular momentum, right? So it's uh, spinning representations and different, different representations of spin. If you were adding them together, then you get these self Gordon coefficients. Here, you see that I that I I used to be just like spin. So again, you get these self Gordon. Okay, so these amplitudes can then be written in terms of Clem's Gordon coefficients and some unknown factors. So these things are unknown. These are things that one can then find from experiments by spin. So then the question is, <clears throat> what does one do? So what one does is write, so we write all of the possible decay amplitudes, three body decay amplitudes, in terms of these Clemson coefficients, multiplied by those, those uh, hadronic matrix elements. So those hadronic matrix elements essentially are those brackets with the trees and the three bar system in them. And those are unknown, right? Those are unknown and those are parameters. So now all you have to do is to show that there are less number of parameters than observables in the system to be, to be actually to be able to do a fit. And once you can do a fit, you can extract out. So particularly in this system, we showed that this is possible to do. There are five decays. So pick these five decays. One has to be clever about which decays to pick, these four and that one. And we showed that those five actually depend on six amplitudes, which have, so whenever you have an amplitude, the amplitude comes with a phase, it has an amplitude and a phase. And it turns out that if you have two amplitudes, there are two magnitudes and one relative phase. So if you have six amplitudes, you have six magnitudes and five relative phases. That's a total of 11. Uh, 11 hadronic parameters. So five decays have 11 hadronic parameters. And by counting the number of observables, we show that there are 12 of them. So you have 12 observables, 11 hadronic parameters, and gamma, which is common to all with all of these decays because gamma is a weak interactive parameter. So now you can run a fit and you can actually find gamma. So the idea then is once one does this sort of analysis and finds gamma, then the question is. So we have not done this yet, of course. This is just a theoretical proposition for finding gamma. So once you do this fit and find gamma, you can then ask the question: Does this gamma match with, you know, all these elements, the direct metal that I talked about, or the same direct metal in terms of the parameters, right? And if these don't match with each other, that means there is some some anomaly, some sort of uh, tension that we do. So, so this is one sort of fun. There are other puzzles, and I'm, I'm just going to, um, I'm kind of, I want to keep to time, so I want to, I'm going to uh, skip over some of these things, and let's go to, I'll talk about the conclusions at this point. Okay, so in hadronic B decays, so there are some uh, some of these cracks in the flavor syndrome, right? So the cracks are essentially, they're all in different kind of puzzles. So I gave you an example of one puzzle, which is this puzzle. That one finds from just looking at three body decays and uh, sort of trying to figure out gamma. And in fact, um, the, uh, this, the, the new method that I talked to you about, that's a proposal. But we did this analysis with data for the fully symmetric case, and we found that there are several kinds of gamma. So there is a discreetly ambiguous solution to the set of the now, only one of those values of gamma can be the correct value. And it turns out that there's one that overlaps with the, the sample value, the one that we showed, we saw in the, in the gamma. So it's still good. But there is no guarantee that if you come up with new methods, that the new solutions will also agree with the sample value. And so that's the purpose of doing this. Um, is this sort of new physics? We don't know. It is possible that our understanding of P2E is just, you know, not good. P2E is a non of the theory. And so it's possible that we do not very clearly understand everything. And so what we are trying to do is we are trying to come up with new models 
that will then explain you know these deviations from from CCD. But what will be key in the upcoming decade is data from from human experiments. So as data comes out, as I as I said at the beginning, right? The, the triangle that I showed you. How will we know if there is some there is none? It's it's with more data. As the data comes out, we'll see that uh, both the wedge and the and the block will become more precise, and that will give us a precision test of of, of the CP violation parameter in the sample. So we'll see in the future. You know, we'll see if this really works out. And I just wanted to, at the end, thank all the people that have been involved in this. There were lots of people, um, UG students, undergraduate students, uh, who have worked with me over the years, um, and the graduate students, uh, particularly postdocs who have been sort of involved in this, um, some some parts of the project. Uh, Lopa Mukherjee, who was a postdoc here, uh, or not, uh, was a master's student here, and was a postdoc later on with other people that I've worked with. And, and uh, Professor Alakabadam, that was a professor in this city, who was a close collaborator. Okay. And they were both uh, friends at So there's a good network of people that are working together on these projects. There's lots of other people who have also contributed. And of course, you know, um, it's worthwhile mentioning the support, right? without support from these um, institutions, very difficult to do work. So I'll stop here. Thank you, and I'm Okay. Uh, so questions? Can you just take that mic to the next? Oh yeah, sure. Questions? Okay. Uh, sir, first of all, it was a really informative and fantastic talk. Thank you. So my question is uh, kind of uh, from the very basic part of your talk, uh, which, was, uh, I, which I have a little uh, trouble in understanding part. The matrix elements of the VCKM matrix. Yeah. So could you just define how exactly this matrix elements are arriving from and uh, what exactly you mean by large diagonal terms? Right. So, good question. So, uh, let's go back to the picture that I have here, the very beginning, hopefully. How do the, your, your question is where do they come from? Exactly. How is your... Yeah. So, here. So, so this is from the standard of the garden. Right, so we diagonalize the uh, the warp map terms. Okay, so forget about the top part. We have diagonalized it, but in order to diagonalize them, you have you have an up part on one side and an up part on the other side. You have basically sandwich between them in some sort of subtle name. So in order to diagonalize, what we do is some sort of a similarity transformation, right? And in yeah. this case, these these transformations turn out to be by unitary transformations for some reason. Details which you know I can tell the story today. But when you do this transformation, what you're doing is you're taking the mass uh, the mass matrix, which is not diagonal, and multiplying them with two two matrices from two different sides. Okay, but how do you do that? You have to think from the four fields themselves on both sides. Yes, to do it. Okay. So now if you do that, then the charge current interactions in the standard model couple with the same four fields. Okay, one and the people. You are on the D. So it means that once you do this transformation in the Higgs, the power sector, you also have to rotate the charge current here. And once you do that, you get a three by two matrix in the middle, which doesn't go away, which is this, which is essentially a U dag of U sort of structure. Okay, so while we're doing this transformation for both sides, the matrix and uh, and this uh, lambda and low elements, uh, what is the significance? The lambda and low where? So, no, so. So is this clear that where the CK matrix comes from? Yeah. Okay. The right. rest of it is experimental, empirical. You go and now you can go and measure them, right? So here, this is a coupling of a W to a U bar and a T. Yes. You, you can now make a U bar and U decay to a T in some way. So let's okay. say the beta decay. Beta decay is a neutron will go proton on the other side is the electron on the other side. Right? So if you go and measure this, that the empty matrix is important over the coupling stress. The UDW effect. So that will tell you the particular matrix element that is DUD. And you can do that for all nine of these elements. Okay, so separately we are doing all these couplings, these interactions, and uh, separately arriving at all these matrix yeah. elements one by one, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Right. And then the, the thing is that if you just do one by one, you will only get the app, the absolute value. You will not get the phase. Okay. 
In order to get the payment, you have to do something more. You have to interfere pain. And then let those interfere. And, and you just mentioned about that the diagram means a large. So yeah. what exactly is signified by the large? Uh, I mean, it's close to unitary and close to identity, I guess. So this is this is a yeah. this, is, this is unit. This is an empirical statement. There is no reason why it has to be. Okay, so they're, they're just closer to unitary terms. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, this is a unitary matrix by definition. But now, so the same matrix also appears in the neutrino factor. So, so, so in the very same way, the off diagram induces more because they are very fast from the unitary part. That's right. But this is not just unitary. It's also closer to identity. So yes. the example that I'm trying to get here. The same matrix also matrix also appears in the neutrino factor, where the neutrino mass eigenstate and the flavor eigenstate go with, go in between through this matrix called the Ponte Corvo Martin and Abagawa Sakawa something P and an S mean. That's one plus two. No, there's four P. <laughs> so CKS, Ponte Corvo neutrino factor is P and S. Okay. Okay, so P C and S. So that matrix turns out to be also unitary. But unfortunately, that is actually that doesn't have the same structure. That is actually that has some sort of maximum matrix service that that mm -hmm. look, it's called tri by maximum. And that matrix is not uh, it doesn't have I mean it's not large along the diagonals. Okay, I mean so it's just an invariable fact that for the CKM, the quark center, the matrix is close to that. So, like the Ryan is learning the quadratic right now. Yeah. Uh, basic question I have like when we are talking about beta decay, like we talked about beta quark decay in the beta. So, the analogy is that like when you do the quark, the, the same kind of reaction that we have in beta decay, so we, uh, we analytically we can also be reactions with quarks, right? The up down quarks are reacting each other and decaying and giving something. We do that we do that analytically when we do beta decay also. So my question is like the quarks are the fundamentals, right? So like you have also shown that the quarks are decaying other quarks. So my question is like how quarks are also decaying if they are the fundamental uh, how, how 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 does the quarks and yeah. yeah. It's a good question. Um, so when can a particle decay? Well, it depends on what the Lagrangian and mode interaction is like. Okay. And uh, and the, the only constraint that we really think is constraint is conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Okay, so if a particle is, has a lot of momentum, it's very tiny, right? And it has a possibility of decaying in something like that, it will decay in that much. Okay. Except if it's the light of the activation. So an example is a proton. The proton does not decay because the proton is the lightest charge atom or lightest charge variant. You have to conserve so so all of the conservation laws in 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 our in Santa tell us well there are you know, if this is the lightest lightest particle that is a variant, their number is conserved. So we can't go to something something else, right? So that's the data that you get. But anything else, if it's a heavier uh, object, if there is a possibility that it is a will be. So when I write in the round here, I write on the one like this, right? So particularly the one that the one that you wrote over here. Um this one. Right? So the U D and a W. Of course, the W is heavier, but there can be a virtual particle that comes out and then. If that W also couples to something on the other side that is lighter than the one on the down part, which it does, electron and neutron, then in that situation, the decay is possible. Okay. So that's the main. So the main thing that you have to worry about is conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. Okay, and conservation of charge, so conservation of gauge charges. So particularly, um, uh, electromagnetic is the charge, electric charge, has to be observed. Um, and then, uh, P3 charges, which is the color. So quantum chromatics has an associated solid charge, which is also concerned. So it can't be divided. So other than that, you know, everything is up, you know, is available. So if it's uh, so particularly the bottom fork couples to all of these forks, right? So the bottom fork couples to if you look at this picture, 
the bottom part comes in this the final column over here. So it couples to the top part, couples to the top part, couples to the up part. The only thing that the bottom part can decay to is the top part because the top part is much heavier than the bottom. But it can decay to a charm part or it can decay to an up. Okay, that means it depends on the mass. It depends on the mass of the part. No, I was saying first time when I heard about the second quartz of the fundamentals, how they can decay. Right. So the fundamental particles have interaction. Okay. Okay. So they interact with other fundamental particles. Other questions? Okay. Is there any question? So yeah, before that the uh, barrier to photo ratio means yeah. that mean is not matching with what is expected from the panel. And uh, and the prediction is you have to violate the CT and the yeah. But within these two numbers, that's what is, uh, is the number in standard model and what you are actually getting. Yeah. Can you predict how much violation? Um, um, required to match with uh, the CMB photo. Right. So this is a great question. Unfortunately, I don't think there is a known answer because it's not just one condition. You have to match all three of them, and there are so. Uh, so I think people have come up with models where where you can predict that if you have this much CMB violation, then you can match the two numbers. People have done that. Uh, there are other problems. With this. You know, you could predict other things that are not that true. And so I don't have a you know exact answer to, um, to the question as to are we are there unique specific numbers for let's say if you provide something this much, then cut out the distribution back. So that I don't think there's a unique answer. Just you have to come up with models where well in your model does this number does all of the numbers then give you um right. So it has to be some sort of an empirical process where you see, well, in the experiment, this is what the CP violation is. And so can you then back up and see what the other things do? Okay. So I had a couple of questions. One is uh, at the very end when we were talking about, so you did this measurement or I mean from the experiment. Right. So how common are these kind of decays? So how right. Uh, so whether they are rare or not. Or, yeah. Uh, so good question. Um, I mean they're not extremely rare decays, but they're one of the issues with a lot of these decays are that they are hadronic and they have pions in them. Pions are extremely difficult to see, especially in big machines like the LHC and stuff, because they are faked by all sorts of other particles. And so you really have to uh, be able to tag. Uh, so to speak, you know, it's tagging means you have to be able to tell the flavor of the part. Right. So when the B decays, the by by first of all, the B is not. You have to create the B, and the B comes from. So if you're in a, in a, in a electron processor in the machine, what you could do. So EC machines are the machines that are run in Japan, for instance. You provide the electron with the positron, and then you let you make this energy. A massive threshold for a particular particle that's like Upsilon. So Upsilon turns out to be a B bar K. So then you're producing a B plus at first. And then this B plus is then decay. But even when it decays, you have to know which one of these has a frame and which one of these doesn't have a frame. And that's a bit of a problem. So while the decay rates are not all, not all that low, it's still very difficult because there are background effects that you know, one has to really understand very clearly. So, um, and one issue is that I'm curious, experimenters don't always care the number. All they do is they write papers and we take the papers. These are the numbers, right? And so our our sort of understanding is kind of like after the fact, once they have written a paper, then we see this is the ranking ratio, these are the you know, number some of the other stuff. In LHCB, are the prime, what are the beams? They are no, 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 so then they then uh, like you said for an electron positron something you yeah for PP then you need to depend on you know what particles you produce from there and from yeah. that. So the idea is so so the uh, in the in the epoch minus machines, the the um detectors are permeted in the sense that they're all around the world. Okay. 
Um, and because this is within the threshold, the P comes out with very low momentum. So you know that you know anywhere around it is an even structure. LST is not like that. First of all, it's a PP machine, and it's extremely boosted compared to the compared to the uh, masses of these parts. So LSTD is actually a forward. So it sits up front. So if this is the collision uh, point, and it sits up front over here. So all the distant particles are the ones that, that are be because these are the ones that have low, low mass and, and high momentum. So those are the particles that are looking. So that's how they sort of distinguish because now they have a kind of flight information from which they can tell the They also do other sorts of play with that in the stuff. But um, but that so it's a mechanism different to the two different factors. And the other question I had was so we always hear about other results like this, uh, for example, this magnetic moment of certain particles yes. or the particular mass of the, I think the top work mass or so one of the mass of the recent work. Yes, the zombie mass are uh, yeah. from, um, So, what are the, I mean, how are those uh, sort of, are those uh, in a way related to what we were talking about? Yeah, it's 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 kind of, I mean, it doesn't happen. So there are two ways that you approach these stuff. So what is the so SAM model is a is a what's called a UV to some extent UV complete theory. The sense that all of the Lagrangian terms that we write down are dimension four terms. So these are renormalizable to all of So these are nice things. But of course, you know, when you try to use physics, you have to, you know, you're guessing. So you often do these things called the second two theories where you write higher of the terms, higher dimensional terms. Which are not normalized. Right? So when you do that, the, the question is do you want to write a term that explains just the physics that they're doing? Versus, you know, so in that case, you would just explain the physics, but not the not the government, not, not the you know, any other thing because we want you minus two. You could write a term that only in fact is first, not the left term. So you want to, I mean again, there might be some effect because you might actually have some hadronic effect, there's this hadronic gas neutralization. Problem. But point is that you can have terms in your Gandhian that are independent. Now, of course, we know that an effective field theory is not a complete picture. Eventually, you'll have to find an incomplete model that is clear. And there it becomes difficult because once you write an incomplete model, you don't have a way of controlling what effective terms you get. It might be <laughs> confusing to other from effective terms. Yeah. So it turns out to be a difficult proposition, right? It's not a very simple game. And it's complicated because there are also sorts of different measurements that are. Um, and the type of things that I focused on are these detection field theories where you just try to explain the puzzle at hand. And then later on, maybe we will find the physical theory. And that's essentially how the standard was also developed. Fermi theory was a non physical theory. And then eventually people came and said, DWF, Dr. Weinberg Salon, is sort of, a, you know, sort of making this more renormalized. Yeah, as you say that if you have an effective field theory that works and then you can come and write down the right, you know, then you can, the you can have. <laughs> yeah. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir, uh, one very last question from exactly this slide that you were just presenting over there. Yeah. You just mentioned in the second last point there are five details which are full observable. So could we just explain those observable parts? No, observable. Yes, exactly. And why is it that you refer to them as observables? Right. So, what is an observable? An observable example of an observable would be a decay rate. Right? A decay rate is something that you can actually have an experiment goes and counts, right? So, you can, so you see how many bees they went to K on to five. So it's a you know, kind of a counting experiment. Count the number of times when they happen. Okay. So, here the observables are a little bit, little more. Uh, a little more complicated because three body decays, and I didn't get the time to talk to you about it. Three body decays have particles that depend on momentum. Right? So you have just the two body decays. So particles decaying into two things. Yes. Right? So the, that, that in the rest of the particle always has to be back to back in the same thing. Like conservation, the conservation, the conservation, the momentum will tell you that if a particle decays into two particles, then they have to be back to back. And because of this nature, you can actually find the momentum of the two particles in terms of the masses of the three particles. There's nothing kinematically, everything is true. Once you go to three particles, this is no, no longer true. 
So in the three part of the system, you can think of the part of the A, the three part of the system goes really fast and you want to go and set up small angles. Or all of them could be going at the same momentum, and then they want to like a like a cost, mm -hmm. right? So because of this, there is some degree of momentum dependence. And because of this momentum dependence, there is a phase space that is extended. And this phase space is often called the Dalit plot, named after Richard Dalit, who used to live in Qatar and travel a long time. What are these numbers? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Dalit plot is the kinematic, kinematic the allowed kinematic area. Now, um, the, uh, so it depends on two parameters, S13 and S12. These one, two, and three are the three particles, right? Now, uh, you can actually divide the Dalit plot, bisect the Dalit plot three times or three lines. Kind of bisecting triangle. Uh, sorry? Kind of bisecting triangle. 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 Yeah. And then you bisect them, you bisect them along the lines where the momenta of two particles are the same. Okay. So now you can see, once you draw those three lines, you can, you can six vectors. get six vectors. And in order to, so I was talking about fully symmetric and fully asymmetric states. In order to find these states, all you have to do is some sort of linear combination of these six sets. So that's the six sets. Now I forget what your original question is. Yeah, I forget also. Uh, uh, that's, that's, so the, yeah. So, so you go here to the Dallas plot and measure, you can always measure the square of the amplitude at any point. Okay. Okay. Right? So that is an observer. Okay. So in that sense, we have two observers in each of these sectors. So let's focus on one sector only because we're doing, you know, when you do a fully symmetrization, only a sixth of this plot will be relevant. So you should only look at one sector. So in that sector, you can measure the amplitude square, and you can measure the square of the complex conjugate of that amplitude, right? Because you know you have a decay and you have TP conjugate. Yeah, very different. It's very different. So for each of these decays, you can measure both of those. So that's two. Two. So two for two for each decay. And then five. Five decay, so that's ten. But I said that's one. Yeah. So the other two. So the other two are so so these two come for any uh, final states, but particularly the final states that look like this. So there are two other final states, two specific final states like these ones, the KG of five plus five minus and KG of K plus K. Okay. So these states are sort of self-conjugate in the sense that if you take a conjugate of that, you get the same thing. Okay, so that reduces two of those uh, observations. Yeah, it it's two, two additional. I mean, it should give us four, but it reduces two of them. The conjugate ones are the same. Sure. Yeah. The ones that I discussed before. Yeah, right. right. There is that one. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's what it's called. Thank you. And uh, one last thing. Uh, yeah, let's take this picture. So is uh, that tangent square on the one? Yeah. 